Hey everyone, welcome back to their Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, the first story is, it's not the drivers. And these 6000 series cards you may have seen have been in the news for the GPU dies basically exploding. And uh, that was rumored to be drivers, or at least it was sort of in the discussion for some reason. It's not the drivers. That's confirmed now, so people can stop panicking about that aspect of it. We'll talk about that today. But we're also talking about custom 12-volt high-power cables uh, because one melted recently on, it was shown on Reddit. 4060 Ti rumors, MSI Afterburner troubles continuing with some updates, and more. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode, cloud computing from Akamai, our web hosting provider that we've been using for over a decade now. In our experience as a long-term customer of Linode, they have reliable server solutions and make server setup easy by providing all kinds of first install scripts and launch points. You can quickly build your own self-hosted VPN, game servers for CSGO, Minecraft, and more by using their quick start guides and extremely detailed documentation. We also have first-hand experience with their support team and can vouch for the quality, even when all the mistakes were mine. Visit linode.com slash gamersnexus to get a $100 credit when you sign up today or click the link below. Okay, so first of all for the AMD story, to get everyone up to speed, basically there's a YouTube channel operated by a repair shop based in Germany. The channel is called ChrisFix and uh, ChrisFix recently did a video talking about customer GPUs, uh, a couple dozen of them that had died and they all pretty much shared the same similarity, which is the GPU core itself was fractured. So the silicon was cracked, which is clearly a problem. This typically, we've shown this happening actually, maybe we'll play a clip of it from when we visited EVGA with Tin back in 2019, and he heated up a GPU die without any cooler on it to show what happens if you just run it with an unlocked power target with improper contact and cooling, and the answer is the die explodes. Uh, so the reason we bring that up is because if this is a thermal issue, uh, the, the failure mode would look correct for a thermal issue. Now, this was basically a four-minute video from Chris Fix where he says, please help me collect information on this. That video then went wild with people. It went from maybe like light speculation about drivers to, oh my god, AMD drivers are killing GPUs. Be careful what driver you install. So we talked to AMD, and uh, AMD wasn't prepared to state everything on the record just yet. Um, we're waiting for them to follow up with us after they work with Chris Fix some more. But they gave us one quote. They said, we're investigating and we take it seriously. From our initial investigation, we've determined it is not the driver. We're continuing to work with Chris Fix to look into the situation. So at least for that end, this is one of those things where it's like, if this were drivers, there would be a lot more failures noted by the community. Uh, it's not the drivers. So if you haven't had this happen, you probably won't have it happen. A couple other notes about this. Those cards, for the most part, like the 6950s, are still under the two-year warranty if it's sold by AMD. Uh, there might be an additional warranty if it's sold by a board partner and has an extended warranty of some kind. So they would be covered. Um, AMD has offered to take at least some of the cards, if not all of them, back and fix it or send out new ones for the customers. Now, in the time since, Chris Fix has done another video where he spends most of the video talking about testing he's done. I'd recommend watching it. And then he kind of concludes eventually that uh, these are secondhand cards that were used in a mining farm originally, and due to either usage or storage issues, that is why they were failing, not the drivers. AMD noted that it tested the most recent three driver revisions. It's gone back a couple months of drivers, and it says uh, none of that changes the power delivery or the hardware checks, and so they're confident that it's not the drivers at this point. So that's where the story is now. Next one, custom 12-volt high power cable uh, burning up. So this is quick, but we wanted to talk about it further because this one's been making the rounds. A Reddit user posted a photo of their cable mod 12-volt high power cable that melted. They used it to power an RTX 4090, and the photos show the damage pretty clearly. The plastic of the connector housing and the insulation partially melted away. There's bare wire underneath, and uh, it's not pretty, but we don't think you should be any more worried about this issue than before. If you look closely at this connector, actually, from the user, you can see a horizontal wear line indicating that it wasn't fully seated. It's like two millimeters sticking out. That's about what you need to make it melt. And also, if you look closely at it, the wear line isn't even on the two sides of the clip, which 
is basically the exact scenario that we showed causes melting in our video. <laughs> it's currently at 258 degrees. I think we see the smoke, Steve. You see the smoke? Andrew, can you see it okay? Did you, did you get the shot? <laughs> this is the best connector in the world. Look at it. Now, CableMod reached out to the user in that Reddit thread and said they're going to replace it for the user. Um, uh, I mean, that's great service because it is user error. I mean, it's just objectively, like looking at it, it's very clearly user error. Uh, so that's cool. Cool that they're replacing it. But anyway, just a reminder for everyone, doesn't matter what 12 volt high power cable you use, make sure it's plugged in all the way because custom or direct from NVIDIA or whatever, they can all have the same problem, which is if it's not seated, it'll melt. Probably that would happen with an eight pin also, but it's got a, eight pins have that more resilient click to them when they socket. So it's clear that it's not connected. Next up, a new rumor from copite 7 kimi on Twitter. This one uh, suggests a 4060 Ti is next to arrive in NVIDIA's GPU suite, but the rumors are all over the place. So this is the, the classic, depending on how early the leak or the rumor is, uh, it's like the earlier it is, the less accurate it is typically. So we'll start with what's published. The rumor comments that an AD106 305A1 GPU would be used for the 4060 Ti, the alleged one, and it's claimed to run 4352 CUDA cores, 8 GB of GDDR6 non-X memory. And Kimi also corrected his original 220 watt claim by stating 160 watts later. This range is massive, and it's why we're normally cautious about reporting on rumors when it's kind of early in the rumor cycle. As it gets towards that last month when all the partners have them, then it's pretty accurate. But uh, 220 watts corrected to 160 watts is a reduction of 30% from the original rumor. So at this point, we're just going to wait for the card to come out to review it, uh, or at least for it to be announced to talk about the specs some more. But for the basics, you, the most important thing is that there's rumors that exist, and those are typically accurate. And it would make sense anyway. So 4060 Ti on the way, I guess. OK, next up is a pretty big story. So this one's about MSI Afterburner. You've probably heard about the basics of this. We have some updates. We've been talking with MSI. And uh, we've also, we were talking with the EBJ months ago about maybe doing something with precision. And now the timing is right. So some commentary on that as well. If you don't know the story, basically MSI's Afterburner overclocking and GPU stats software, it's incredibly useful even for non-OC stuff like tuning the fan curve. That is currently stalled for development. Uh, they've basically been put on hold. And the reason for this is MSI has been unable to pay Afterburner's only developer. There's only one of the uh, devs they retain for building Afterburner. It's the same person who builds Riva Tuner Statistics Server. However, RTSS is something that is his own project, so he's still developing that. So uh, we did confirm that MSI hasn't been able to pay him, so that's fact. It's not an alleged or a claim or anything. And uh, Afterburner's developer, um, the reason he hasn't been able to get paid, according to MSI, is due to trade sanctions against Russia, because the developer is in Russia. Now, we're not geopolitics reporters. I have no way to realistically verify that statement. I don't know if that's how it works or not. Um, it's also complicated because MSI has an office in Taiwan. They have a, a primary headquarters there. They have a major office and factory in China. They have another headquarters, like a, a major branch in California and the US. So I don't know. I don't know how it works. But let's just take them at their word. They say they're not allowed to pay him, basically. So Afterburner's primary dev, his name is Alexei Nikolaychuk. He posted on the Guru 3D forums. And this is the recap for you. His handle is Unwinder. And as Unwinder, he says he has been upholding his end of the agreement to update Afterburner for about 11 months without pay. He says that MSI's multiple attempts to fix the situation have resulted in nothing but disappointment. His quote, Unwinder will try to continue to support an Afterburner while he has free time going forward, but he says he'll likely need to shift focus off the project if things don't change. So now for the updates. We reached out to MSI twice. Once was when this first happened. Uh, and they provide us with this statement. Quote, thank you for checking. Our headquarter product marketing and accounting team are dealing with this now. Due to the war, the payment couldn't transfer successfully, but we are still keeping in touch with him and figuring out the solution to resolve it soon. Now, we followed up a week later, actually just yesterday at the time of filming, maybe, maybe two days when this uploads, 
and uh, we asked if there's been any progress. MSI said the following, quote, Yes, our headquarters is dealing with the developer directly, and we still want to continue supporting Afterburner for sure. So that's good that they want to continue to try and resolve it, but it sounds like it's a really complicated situation, so we don't know how it's going to play out. Now, Unwinder is also a developer of RTSS. Um, RTSS comes with Afterburner. It's used for on-screen overlays. It shows FPS, temperature, things like that. It tracks statistics for the GPU. That is fully independent software. It doesn't require Afterburner. So that'll continue to work. He plans to continue developing it. And uh, he says he enjoys keeping it up to date as a hobby. So that one should be fine. Unwinder's history, though, if you don't know, runs pretty deep. So the Riva Tuner Statistics Server, RTSS, the reason it has that name is because it was developed for the NVIDIA TNT Riva GPUs in 1997. So it was built for monitoring and for overclocking of the Riva TNT. Uh, and I mean, it's been updated and supported now from 97 till today. It's a lot of years. I don't really want to count them. <laughs> It'll feel bad. But uh, through the G4700 series, it was every GPU was supported. And several Radeon GPUs from AMD and previously from ATI before AMD bought it. Eventually, RTSS was licensed by several companies, so it was used in the backbone of the early version of EVGA Precision X. It was used in tools like Afterburner. Currently, it's used in ASUS GPU tweak, so it's everywhere. Now, the Precision integration is a very messy, separate story. Uh, they no longer work together is the short version of it, and that predates EVGA's announcement. That, that goes back pretty, pretty far. Now, since 2013, Riva Tuner has stopped receiving updates in favor of Afterburner. It sounds like that's going to change. We don't know how it's going to shake out at this point. Um, if development stops on Afterburner, it leaves the community with basically no tools for controlling NVIDIA GPU hardware. I mean, like AMD has first-party tools. They're not great, but they're first-party, and they work. Sometimes. Uh, the fan curves don't really work all the time, but they kind of work. NVIDIA doesn't have any first-party tools. If they do, we're a little bit scared of how they integrate them because if it ends up in GeForce Experience, it's going to have a, a login wall behind it. So, um, so yeah, EVGA is not developing Precision. It currently works on the 40 series. It's not supported officially. Afterburner is not really getting updates in a meaningful way. And so you're not left with much. Now, several months ago, actually right around the EVGA announcement of departing NVIDIA's uh, partnership, we asked EVGA about, hey, could you maybe sell Precision? Because I personally really like using Precision for overclocking. I've had the most success with it in our streams. I find it a little easier to work with than Afterburner. Afterburner is great. Don't get me wrong, but uh, we don't use any of the on-screen display stuff. We have other tools for that. And Precision just has always worked well for me because I understand how it works and it's very predictable. So we floated the, the idea of, hey, you guys should sell it for like 10 bucks on Steam. And um, they basically said they would need to see significant interest from the community to, to do that. But now that EVGA is not working with NVIDIA, uh, feasibly they could update it to also work with AMD cards and maybe with Intel. That'd be pretty cool. And with Afterburner being a giant question mark right now, there's going to be a gap in the market. It would really suck to lose Afterburner and Precision because there's no other well-established tool. I mean, the same developer built the backbone for like Asus Tweak. So there's no remaining tool. It's kind of sets a scary precedent where NVIDIA at some point looks at it and go, uh, people aren't really overclocking anymore. Why don't we turn that off? And even if it's just because of software. Now, NVIDIA could develop an OC12 of its own. Um, if they do, we think they should call it Detonator. That's what their first drivers were named, so it'd be a good name for it. All right, Stadia's departure is final at this point. So Stadia has shut down now. Google Stadia, the streaming service that Google launched, game streaming, shut down on January 18th, so last day. They released a few updates, though, in those final days. It actually becomes kind of just a sad story at this point. But one of them is for the controller, where it allows you to enable wireless uh, and, well, enable Bluetooth connectivity. And the other one is the team releasing its final game. And this is just the sad one. So the team released a tool it used for internal testing. They wrote a nice note about it. They said that they used it for years behind the scenes to test all the new features that they were building. And they called it Worm Game. It's a tribute. It is 
it's, I mean, it, it genuinely was a little bit sad to read the note because these are people who really cared about it. And, uh, you know, they're releasing it just because they want the world to see it before it all goes away. So the game's available for free. I don't know if it's still up at the time this goes up since the service has shut down. But a lot of people were leaderboarding in it for at least the last couple days. Google also launched an online flashing tool and accompanying help page for their controllers. So the hardware is still good. And this requires you to open the update page in Chrome and only Chrome, connect the controller to the PC via a USB cable, and then perform the flash. Google says this process is irreversible and will entirely disable the Wi-Fi functionality on board previously used to connect to the Stadia servers. The assistant and the share buttons will also cease to function, but they can be remapped. After the update's done, you'll be able to pair the controller with systems running Windows 10 and 11, uh, Mac OS 13, Chrome OS, or Android. Google warns that pairing will require the device to be compatible with Bluetooth low energy mode, which doesn't allow some features such as audio pass-through. That said, audio pass-through will still work if the controller is connected via USB. And the flashing process is available until December 31st, 2023. So make sure to set a calendar reminder to flash old controllers uh, late this year. But if you miss it and you buy one on eBay, you might have trouble using it later. Now, this final move comes from a lot of requests from the community seeking Google to enable open pairing with any device for the Stadia controller. Uh, it's nice to see Google make this effort. I mean, it's, it's real hardware. And I mean, it's not bad as a controller. So um, it helps at least reduce e-waste by giving people another connection option aside from wired USB, which would be the only one otherwise. And it keeps the old hardware functional for longer. Maybe you can use it for some other game just on the PC. Next up, AlphaQuil has released a new distro plate. It connects to the top of radiators, and uh, they come in sizes 240 to 360 millimeters. Like all other distro plates, they integrate the reservoir, pump, and fitting locations to create a centralized area where all your tubing terminates. Unlike the others, the ports where you attach the fittings are not just threaded holes in the plexiglass, but they're actually chrome-plated brass threaded inserts. Pretty high end. This construction removes most of the risk of cracking that comes with screwing metal fittings into relatively brittle plexi. We think it's genuinely a good move and it should help with long-term durability. As for mounting, it's handled by AlphaCool's push mount system. They say you attach the standoffs to the mount location and then you just push the distro plate into the standoffs without any tools. We just hope that's very secure because uh, it could be bad otherwise. There's water after all. Now, the core distro plates are going to be available in left or right configurations, and the pricing is kind of high, as it always is for water cooling components, but it's going to be 160 euros for the 240 and 200 for the 360, uh, and the left or right side alignment is basically where do you want the pump. Next up, Inwin is bringing three new cases to market. Some of them require assembly. Actually, they, they all require assembly, just different levels of assembly. So it's like the IKEA approach to cases, could be kind of interesting. They tried this with that Lego case we reviewed last year, and it was a start, but now they're going all in. First, the POC is a mini ITX case that requires the user to literally bend panels and tabs into shape before it's put together. Inwin's page for the POC asserts that, quote, you must have attempted to do origami as a child, right? I, yeah, we all did origami. Um, I actually still do origami. See? It's a sheet of paper folded in half. Pretty advanced. The POC's final form includes handles for transport, a single RGB fan, and a PCIe 4.0 riser cable to connect to a GPU in a separate chamber. Also, we think someone at Inwin might have really liked that one wager mode from Black Ops. Anyway, the panels are made of 0.8 millimeter steel and the case will come flat packed. This cuts down on cost for the company and theoretically allows for a less expensive price tag. The POC will be available in green and yellow or black and blue colorways, and uh, we'll plan to look at it when it comes out. Next is a full tower case called the Dubly, and this one ships flat packed but doesn't require any bending. This one is way more industrial looking. It's somewhat reminiscent of the cheese grater Mac Pro case. And the Dubly comes disassembled, requiring you to build it by linking the metal frame and the panels together with large screws. The vertical pieces at the front and rear of the case can act as either handles or feet, depending on how you attach them, 
and once it's all together, the case has support for up to three 30 millimeter wide EATX boards, two triple radiators, and up to nine fans. Finally, Inwin unveiled the Mod Free, a totally modular case built from several frames that hook together in various configurations. The idea here is that the user can buy these modules to arrange the layout however they like, and there's a main core frame that looks like most of uh, a case by itself, and also a smaller PSU module and several expansion modules. Inwin says that there will be more than 50 possible combinations in total. They say more modules are coming in the future, and the Mod Free will be available as several preset combinations, we assume as individual pieces as well. So it's a cool idea, but if the cost to put together a reasonable case ends up being higher than you buying one built, then obviously it'll have trouble being sold. But it's possible that this approach, it depends on their volume, right? But if they can flat pack everything because of this and let you deal with the shipping, like Ikea does unironically, then it may end up actually being cheaper in, in some ways because they fit more uh, in a container when they ship it to whatever country you're in. So maybe it ends up being good. Up next, Intel and its board partners have finally released some cheaper boards for the Intel 13th gen CPUs. So these are B760 and H770. As usual, they have several things cut down from the Z790 chipset. One of them is you can't overclock CPUs. Another one is you lose some PCIe lanes, some USB, some SATA, the usual stuff that gets hacked off to, uh, to segment the market or to reduce the cost, depending on how you want to look at it. So if you intend on using a 13100F, 13400F, 13600, 700, 900, non-K, then these make more sense. If you're buying a KSQ CPU, don't buy one of these. Uh, it's pointless because the whole point of those is they're unlocked. So the vast majority of these are B760. We only found two H770 options at the time we we're writing this. Both of those are from ASUS. Motherboards with these chipsets generally are less expensive than the 90 series, the Z series, because of the cut down features. And since there's no C support, uh, VRM can be cut down as well. A quick spot check shows them ranging from 110 bucks for the ASRock B760M, HDV, M2, D4. There's a terrible name. It sounds like a monitor. Uh, and it goes up to $230 for the ASUS Pro Art B760 Creator D4. That name's a little weird too. Anyway, that last price is a little steep for a cut down board like this since there are several Z790s in the same price range of the D4 if you're wondering DDR4. So at least that's clear naming. Now, as a, a reminder as well, 600 series chipset boards are generally compatible with the 13th gen CPUs with a BIOS update. There might be exceptions, you just check their support page when you're looking to buy it. But remaining stock of these boards, it's less expensive on average due to sales, other discounts, they're older. So if you plan to go that route, you could save money. Just if that board's been on the shelf for a while and the BIOS hasn't been updated, then you'll need a 12th gen CPU on hand to flash with, or you could use the BIOS flashback feature if the board has it, just make sure it does. As a last note here, this is a big part of what's keeping Intel competitive for value versus AMD. AM5 B650 boards start at about $160, and they quickly ramp from there, as well as requiring the use of more expensive DDR5. The 7600 non-X helped AMD's value proposition, but Intel's platform cost remains lower, unless you're going to go back to AM4 or something. So that's it for the hardware news recap for this one. We actually, we had so many news stories for this week. Uh, I'm going to take like three of these. One of them is really cool. It's about the height Y60 accessories they're launching, and they're kind of interesting. But we're going to move those into another news video just because uh, this one's already pretty long. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can check back for the next video and go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab a shirt like this one. We'll see you all next time.